All right, good morning, everybody. I ask you to please stand while we do the scripture reading. We are continuing our study of the Beatitudes. We are in Matthew 5, 4, which says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Unlike many modern commentators, the 4th century church father Gregory of Nyssa sees in the ordering of the Beatitudes divine purpose. For Gregory, these blessings are arranged kind of like celestial steps, we might say, which are hewn in the mountainside, facilitating, as he wrote, the ascent of the reader from one level to the next. What he means by that is that it's only when one reaches the first beatitude that he will come to behold the goodness and the necessity of the second and therefore be motivated to continue his ascent. For who but the poor in spirit will recognize the beauty and fittingness of mourning? And who but those who have mourned earnestly will embrace meekness as the means for reclaiming our inheritance of the earth, and so on it goes. All of which is to say that if we want to reach the summit of true blessedness, becoming one who finds even the reviling and persecution of his enemies a blessing, then we must begin our journey at the foot of the mountain, in the lowliness of spirit. And only then can we work our way up. So standing as we are on the first step, at least that's the case in terms of our conceptual understanding, because these things are meant to be embodied, right? Not just understood. But given our now conceptual understanding of step one, the first beatitude, we are now ready to begin our ascent to the second beatitude. So what then does this enigmatic expression mean? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, it's quite common for interpreters to view the object of this blessed bereavement to be the awareness of sin. Thus, Jesus' reference here to mourning in Matthew 5, 4 is akin to the godly grief, which Paul speaks about in 2 Corinthians seven ten, which is, of course, the pain or anguish that we experience from sin's guilt. And yet, as the apostle says, this is a sanctifying sorrow, as we might call it, because it produces in us repentance, which then leads to salvation without regret, is how Paul puts it. And this kind of godly grief is contrasted by the apostle with what he calls worldly grief, which seems to be a sorrow that's directed at the consequences of one's sin rather than the sin itself. It's a regret that you are being held accountable for your wrongdoing. It's being sorry you got caught, in other words. And it produces, says Paul, resentment. And that then leads eventually to death. And the reason why worldly grief merits this kind of condemnation is because in its essence what it is is a sham. It serves to motivate the kind of feigned repentance that we see time and again in the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who on one occasion sort of stepped forward to be baptized by John. I guess they were thinking they could just sneak in with the crowd, but to to whom the baptizer replied, you brood of vipers, bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance which tells us that a sign that our grief is of the worldly kind, the kind that leads to condemnation, is that it bears no fruit, neither the fruit of repentance nor the fruit of righteousness, meaning that neither our heart nor our behavior changes as a result of our grieving. It's an impotent kind of grieving. Infocund is the technical term, which means essentially a fruitless sorrow. Now, the blessing of godly grief, godly despair, on the other hand, is that through it, the Lord lavishes upon the repiner, the repentant, not only true repentance, 
but also the righteousness which is its produce. A liberation not only from sin's guilt, but its power. A freedom of obedience that's only available to those who earnestly mourn over their sin. A blessed anguish which Paul's audience in 2 Corinthians apparently experienced, for they had repented of the lawlessness which had been cataloged in the apostles' first epistle to them. And that catalog catalog represents a depravity that's so deep, it included a man defiling his own father's marriage bed. Deep depravity. And yet the sting of Paul's critique in his first epistle had penetrated even deeper than that depravity. This is the sword of of the spirit cutting down to the marrow, not to kill the infirmed Corinthians, but to cure their disease. And it caused, no doubt, a significant amount of grief in their hearts when they received this letter. In fact, throughout church history, 1 Corinthians is often referred to as the severe letter. Right? You read through it and you realize, wow, this is a rebuke. It's a rebuke of rebuke. So no doubt the recipients of that letter were grieved to their soul. And yet they did not regret the pain that they experienced in that. But rather in time they rejoiced in it because they knew what it would accomplish, which is true repentance. Which tells us, if we speak in Paul's words here from 2 Corinthians 7, there is a kind of sorrow that we regret, and there is a kind of sorrow that we don't regret, that we in fact rejoice in. And it's only the second of those which brings true conversion and then comfort. Now it's fashionable for today's cultural commentators to declare that modern society under the influence of people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Friedrich Nietzsche, and particularly Sigmund Freud, has essentially lost its sense of guilt. And therefore, to appeal to the reward of comfort, which comes through earnest mourning, is vanity. That what we need to do instead is to direct our efforts toward other felt needs which are more acute, like the sense of alienation and estrangement that so many are experiencing in this increasingly atomized world, or the loss of communitas, of community, and its accompanying loneliness, which has caused so many to long for consolation, and many others we could mention. All of which, of course, are fitting shadowlands to explore with the light of the gospel. However, though, I agree with Wilfred McClay, who argues that far from having stepped out from guilt's shadow, our society rather, it seems, has become lost within it. And the fact that many have missed this truth, I think, is due in part to the guile of guilt, its ability to shapeshift, if you will, to change its form and location, to morph. It's a shifting shadow, as James would refer to it. And one prominent form that guilt presently takes, and it's one we've discussed at great length, is the guilt of privilege and achievement which overwhelms particularly upper-class white women in the social justice movement. But another form which isn't discussed as often, although I think it's going to become more and more prominent, is present among extreme environmentalists. Many people today feel immense guilt over the present fallen state of our planet and have grown weary of their own contribution to its decline, however small that might be. And they long for the ability to restrain their corrupting influence, wishing they could go and sin no more. But the only way to remove one's effect upon the environment entirely, of course, is to shrink their carbon footprint to zero, which would include no longer breathing or eating for that matter. One columnist, in desperation suggested eating roadkill. And I'm hoping that this article is gonna be found exposed to be a hoax. I'm praying that that will be the case, but with roadkill, you know, they're already, it's already dead. And so we might be morally justified in feasting upon it is the kind of reasoning here. These wretched souls are so consumed by guilt that they often contemplate, in fact, suicide. 
and not just individually, but for the entire race. Believing that extinction is the only way to expiate the guilt of man's, mankind's transgressions against nature. Having turned from the atonement of Jesus, these miserable creatures can only find consolation, in other words, in fantasizing about the destruction of the whole human race. About which, of course, if you think about it, they're half right. right? Man is worthy of total annihilation. And with that, we can agree. But their zeal for righteousness is not, is not according to knowledge, as Paul would say. For they have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling birds and animals and creeping things, trading the truth about God for a lie and worshiping and serving the creature, the creation itself, Mother Nature, rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen, as Paul says. The point being that many today ache in their bones, as David did, for the comfort of forgiveness. But in order to receive it, they must join the king in crying out to God against you and you alone have I sinned. What is needed is the realization that godly sorrow, right, sorrow whose object is our sin against an infinite holy God, that that godly sorrow alone can bring restoration. And so we should absolutely tell them that blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now having said all of that, it seems to me that Matthew 5, 4 is pointing us to something broader than just the grieving that's necessary in order to enter into the kingdom of God, as quite a few people have interpreted it. It's talking about more than just our initial conversion, mourning so that we can repent and receive the blessings of salvation. Because if Jesus had meant to indicate a once-for-all repentance for sin, it would have been more consistent to call blessed those who have mourned rather than those who are always mourning, which the verb here indicates. Blessed are those who continuously mourn, seems to be the point of this beatitude. And thus, the continual need for mourning suggests the continued existence of the source of that mourning. And I think that the object of this perpetual sorrow takes at least two forms in Scripture. The first I've already mentioned, which is the remnant sin of our still fallen nature, that the flesh is still within us, which is to say that godly grief is not just essential for justification, for initiation into the covenant, but also godly grief is necessary for sanctification, by which in some sense we maintain that covenant and we grow in holiness. Speaking to Christians who are supposedly in fellowship with Christ, John in 1 John 1, verses 8 through 10, says this, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Even the regenerate Christian, in other words, continues to sin. And those sins must be grieved over and repented of. To fail to do so will stunt the spiritual growth of the Christian. And in time, at least according to the book of Hebrews, it will lead to the death of the Christian's faith. Thus, we must be continuously mourning over our sins so that the times of refreshing might come from experiencing divine forgiveness. Indeed, gratitude, as we've said many times before, is what drives our obedience. And that gratitude swells when the faithfulness and justice of God manifests itself as the record of our debt which stands against us is canceled. And if we try to shortcut that process, as we often do, by jumping straight to forgiveness, right? By offering a quick, oh, I'm sorry, and then we put it out of our mind. If we do that, if we, if we experience, in other words, little grief over our transgressions, it will mean that we will experience little gratitude over their remittance. Jesus said, he who is forgiven little will love little. 
So we must not regret the necessity of godly grief. We must not regret the necessity of its pain to such an extent that we are unwilling to receive it, that we try to avoid it. Instead, we must embrace it, knowing that its end is true repentance and righteousness. This was embraced by the church at Corinth, right? We like to joke, right? It's like Las Vegas of the, uh, the ancient world in Corinth, and yet they received the most brutal critique, and they received it. And they experienced, no doubt, significant rejoicing because of it. So we must lavish upon God our contrition so that he may lavish upon us his life-changing comfort. Now the second form that the object of our perpetual grieving takes is broader than this. For Jesus in Matthew 5 is likely alluding to Ecclesiastes 7, 2 through 4. Excuse me, Matthew 5, 4. Jesus is likely alluding to Ecclesiastes 7, 2 through 4, which is a very familiar passage to us, no doubt. And it says this, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is is in the house of mirth. So the object of mourning here is, of course, death itself. Solomon essentially saying that in spite of all of our scientific and technological advancement, it remains the case that from the moment we are born, we are on a journey to death. That while there are many paths set before us from which we may choose, they invariably lead to the same end. And therefore, each of us must come face to face with the grim reality that our future lies in a grave, which is the ultimate consequence of our sin. And yet modern man does everything that he can do to avoid this truth and the mourning which would accompany it, busying himself with one pursuit after another, just as Solomon did. But even this isn't enough, of course, For even though he at present is alive, people all around him are dying. And so he must find some way to detach himself as much as possible from that reality. And one of the places where we see this delusional detachment is in the way that modern man conducts funerals or what has become known as a celebration of life ceremony where, by the way, there is almost no grieving at all, at least at the ones I've been to, where everything is upbeat, right? Upbeat worship music, positive prayers that are being offered, a reassuring talk, everything's going to be okay. Indeed, if you were to stumble upon such a service, you might confuse it with a retirement party. As far as I can tell, this is an attempt to reduce the threat of death, the reality of it that Solomon speaks of so starkly by sentimentalizing it. In other words, we're living in a time not just of kitsch art, right? Art that reduces human pathos, human emotion which is deep and rich and overwhelming with the sentimental, but also kitsch funerals. One celebration of life service I attended was for a man who committed suicide. Someone, in other words, who had abandoned all of his responsibilities, including the shepherding of his wife and young children. By the way, suicide, as as many uh, sociologists have noted, is a disease of the affluent. You don't find suicide in uh, mass amounts of suicide in Zimbabwe and other places where people struggle uh, to survive, right? It's, it's for the affluent, right? A man could think, well, I'll take my own life, but, you know, society, my family, the government will take care of my family, and so, you know, nothing will be lost by this. But when I attended this, I thought, surely they are not going to do the standard sanitation job here. They can't. Scrubbing the service of any semblance of true sorrow and regret. But sure enough, they did. He was honored like the recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Oscars, being venerated as a great husband, a great father, and a great employee. 
without a single mention as to the cause of his death or the great sin which lay behind it. And by the way, the one thing that really ruins these celebrations apparently is, is to have a body present. For no one wants to be reminded, it seems, that the deceased died. It's much preferred to imagine that he just disappeared, I guess. And with cremation, that is essentially what happens. Such a sanitizing service is a great way for those present to avoid being confronted by their own mortality, by the danger of death, the consequence of it. But for the immediate family, the briefness and lightheartedness of it is utterly inadequate. It means that as soon as the hour-long shindig is over and the casserole eaten, the family is left to suffer on their own. Grieving in the modern world is best done in isolation, it seems, so as not to burden anyone else with the reality of sin's ultimate consequence. In the pre-modern world, though, things were very different, in part because the lack of technology mercifully prevented such a disconnected approach, for they couldn't escape the reality of death. They were surrounded by it. And so they were forced to sufficiently mourn it. And thus the grieving process was much longer, sometimes lasting weeks. In Deuteronomy 34, 8, we are told that the Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. 30 days. You're lucky now if you have a chance to mourn for 30 minutes before everybody's ready to move on. In fact, my prediction is in the near future, we won't have funerals at all. There'll be nothing. People will simply grieve in isolation. That's the direction we're headed in. It will be the polite thing to do, not to burden anyone else with the reality of death and the loss of death. But in the biblical world, grieving was done in community, where friends and relatives would stay with the immediate family providing meals and comfort throughout the entire mourning period. Prayers would be continuously offered. The Torah would be regularly read. Memorial candles would be lit. There were even professional mourners who would play music and chant dirges. When Jesus arrived at the home of Jairus, who was the ruler of the synagogue and whose daughter had just died, he found, according to Mark 5.38, a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. These are not people who just, you know, are out of control, that are being ridiculous, right? Just calm down. You're making too much of this. This is a master class in mourning that we catch just a glimpse of. This is grieving as a high art that goes over a longer period of time which is to say that as advanced as we have become in terms of scientific knowledge and technology, we have regressed to the Stone Age in terms of mourning. For we think that we can avoid such grief, staying forever in the house of feasting. But this is vanity. For it is only through mourning that one can experience true comfort, says Jesus. As we have said before, you can't skip over the fasting and go straight to the feasting. And those of you who skip the fasting for Friday night's fellowship feast know exactly what I'm talking about, right? To cheat and skip to the feasting reduces one's delight in the meal. There's no way around it. It's a law of nature. And so fasting is the necessary preparation of the mind and body for feasting. It's the only way to prepare yourself for the feasting to take full benefit of it. Indeed, the biblical pattern is, is to fast in order to feast. That true feasting can only come through fasting. And of course, fasting and mourning are tied together in Scripture. Fasting is a sign of our mourning and the absence of the bridegroom, mourning over the sweeping consequences of our sin, etc. The problem for many American Christians is that we've jumped right over, the, over to the feasting, Right, we've just jumped to the feasting. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why we have the obesity problem that we have. Right? A newcomer to our country should look around and say, they've got a fasting problem, or maybe a feasting problem, but they're jumping to the feasting. They're skipping the fasting. 
This is a, a sin of impatience that we have unfortunately inherited from our primordial parents. The deceitful desire to skip the morning and go straight to the comforting. As I said, as Jesus says, such is vanity. And just as we have to practice fasting, as we discussed, right, by regularly abstaining from food in order to prepare ourselves for true feasting, which contains every spiritual blessing. In other words, we practice fasting from food in order to reinforce this principle that in order to truly feast, you must fast. That's why we fast from food, right? We're supposed to be fasting from many things. Every spiritual blessing is, is a one form or another comes from a type of fasting, as we've, we've discussed. But the reason we fast from food is it's, it's a way for us to practice this. So the principles reinforce to us again and again that in order to engage in real feasting, you have to fast to get there. And just as that kind of practicing is necessary when it comes to fasting, the same is true when it comes to mourning. We have to practice mourning to prepare ourselves for true comfort. And that practice is called lament. And it's something that has been utterly lost in, mo in the modern evangelical church. We don't know what lament is. Most evangelicals, I bet, have never even heard of it. For all of our talk of being biblical, we've actually ignored an entire book of the Bible called Lamentations. And I'll tell you how bad this is. Not only, and I fully confess to you know, my own neglect of this in all the years of preaching, okay? I, as far as I know, not only have I never preached a sermon, not one from the book of Lamentations, but I don't think I've ever even referenced it in a sermon. Not one time. This book is almost entirely, ignored entirely. And I'm not the only one meaning that there is an entire facet of Christianity that we have neglected, lament. And what lament is, is, is that it's a, it's a biblical prayer language, you might say, which helps to prepare the mind and body for comfort in times of real loss, right? It teaches you how to mourn, and you might think, well, mourning is natural. You don't have to be taught that. Well, you can make the same argument about prayer. Prayer is natural. Right? Anybody could engage in a primitive prayer where they just cry out to God. Right? But as mature Christians, you don't remain with the primitive prayer. The disciples went to Jesus and said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. There is a way to grow in your prayer life, in your capacity to pray, so that you can express yourself to God in his language. Right? The same is true for singing. You might say, well, people sing you know, innately almost. I think you can follow along, but if you practice your singing, right, and improve in it, it, your worship can be set free, and it can become full. It can come to the point where you don't have to think about the mechanics of praying, right, but you just pray from your heart because the language is there. It's on the tip of your tongue. The same is true of mourning. We have forgotten how to mourn in our culture. In generations past, it was, it was passed down. You learned to mourn while, while you watched your parents mourn and mourned right along with them. Well, we've cut ourselves off from that. We no longer know how to mourn, and so we avoid it like the plague. And one of the things that lament gives you, as I said, is it gives you the words to properly express your grief to God. Have you ever noticed that when you are with someone who is suffering deeply, you are at a loss for what to say. Or you say something that's totally inappropriate to the situation. Commonly, that's not true of those who know how to mourn, of those who have suffered deeply, those who have fully embraced mourning. And maybe they've embraced it because it was forced upon them, which, by the way, highly likely will be forced upon every one of us at some point, right? Where we are laying prostrate on the ground before God, utterly ruined, totally desperate for his intervention, for his comfort. Those who have been through that experience, right? They know what to say and what not to say and when to be quiet because they've been there. 
They've experienced it. They've lived it. So we need to return to this practice of lament. The question will be, can we? Can we reinstate something like this? Throughout church history, it's present. Come into the modern world, it's gone. It is so foreign to us. The idea of starting to practice it is going to seem so strange. So maybe we can't. Maybe we will lack the motivation to reinstate it. But I will say this, if things continue in the direction they're going, right? it may be that comfort becomes our greatest felt need. We will be so desperate for comfort and so inept in our ability to mourn that we will then return to our roots and begin this practice again of learning how to mourn so that we can be comforted. What I do know is that we will fare much better in the future if that is the reality, if we start to prepare ourselves now in order to receive it. But as I said, it is a practice foreign to us. So I close with Jesus' words again in Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Thank you.